Good afternoon. I'm Landon Winklevoss, co-founder of Nisos, and today I will be your moderator. For the next 30 minutes, we will be talking about flexibility being the key to a threat intelligence program. Quick out, some quick housekeeping note items here. Uh, this meeting is going to be recorded and will be available afterwards on the website and via email. After the conclusion of the webinar, you will receive a brief summary, one page, of the discussion. Thanks for coming. Here are today's panelists, who you'll be hearing from momentarily. And here's today's agenda. On the agenda today will be cyber threat intelligence for incident response and insider threat investigations, broad investigations for trust and safety teams, addressing real-time threats to personnel and facilities, monitoring and responding to global events, and rapid assessments for acquisitions. Stress is, a common, uh, stress is common for threat intelligence teams. Uh, depending on the scale of an organization's and its digital footprint and the need for speed, that stress can almost be constant. Uh, building and maintaining investigative capability that can scale with the business's operational tempo is critical to satisfying stakeholders with time and relevant answers to their questions. Just as important is the ability to properly triage and manage expectations for the analysis that will take place. Uh, let's get it started with our panelists before we dive into questions. Uh, Joe Oni, can you give a little bit of background about your background for our listeners, please? Yeah, thanks for having me, Landon. Um, so my background, uh, before right now on DSO, so I'm a, a senior intelligence consultant, you can see in the title there. Um, and I do answer a lot of questions for clients. Uh, that's our job. Uh, previous to that, uh, I was at a uh, Hogan Levels, a global law firm where I led security operations, um, did a lot of intelligence led security operations work. Prior to that was at UPS um, and I uh, was in the security operations center there. And uh, before that was uh, in the military, digging ditches and also doing some intelligence work here and there. So my name is Alicia Williams. I am an Intel analyst here at Nisos. I've been here coming up right on a year. Uh, prior to being at Nisos, I was with the North Carolina State Bureau of Investigation. So I come from a law enforcement intelligence analyst background. Um, and then prior to that, I was with another private sector company also doing Intel. So I have about 10, 11 years of doing Intel work, and uh, I'm excited to be here with you guys today. Hi, my name is Valerie. I was uh, recently uh, given the OSINT monitoring and analysis team, so that is open source intelligence monitoring and analysis, and I am the managing principal here at NISOS. So before that, I worked in law enforcement intelligence, the North Carolina State Bureau of Investigation, and prior to that, the Georgia State Bureau of Investigation. So criminal intelligence and exigent and long-term casework. All right. Hey, uh, so I'm Seth Arthur, managing principal here at Nisos, um, where I manage the RFI team. Um, prior to Nisos, I got my start in intelligence in the Navy um, many years ago now. Uh, went from there to DIA, where I worked uh, a couple of different uh, counterterrorism problem sets. Um, fell in love with OSINT while I was at DIA, uh, realized that the government wasn't doing a great job of it, and uh, knew that I had to go private sector, so I moved over here to Nisos. Um, also uh, spent some time working for Uber on their uh, security investigations team, and uh, yeah, that's about it. Let's, let's, let's dive in. Um, let's talk about cyber threat intelligence uh, and how it supports incident response. Um, typically in, in cyber threat intelligence, uh, you see two backgrounds, right? You see investigative background. Uh, a lot of people come from the intelligence community like Seth and Joe, and you see a very data engineering background. Uh, from your perspective, Joe, you know, how uh, is cyber threat intelligence uh, used uh, specifically for solving uh, around incident response escalations? Yeah, so uh, IR, uh, you know, incident response as a process is cyclical, cyclical, just like the intelligence process, and they have a lot of things in common, right? Um, and so depending on where you are in your IR engagement is the type of, you know, determines the type of intelligence that you're looking for, because you're, you know, as you're doing it, you really want to know, like, what's the next source of best information? How can I make the next decision uh, as accurately as possible? So you're looking at, for all of the information you can get. Um, early on in, in the IR process as you're starting, well, if, if you're in a bad spot, you know, bad intelligence might have started your IR process, right? Nobody likes that, getting an IP and having no idea what the context is. But hopefully, early on, you have the context. That's what's leading your investigation. Like, right, is this attacker? Is this type of malware? You're going through things. And then on the on the back end of that, at the, at the lessons learned, or maybe even before that, if you're at a very mature organization, using intelligence 
to to develop your security infrastructure, uh, to make changes to your IT infrastructure, to, to really become more resilient. Like we, we've had clients come to us and say, hey, you know, um, we really want to become more resilient at a very mature level. So we do that full analysis of like they're, they're least likely, uh, they're attackers, they're most likely, they're most dangerous, like mapping all of it to to uh, the MITRE techniques and, and the, uh, the TTPs, right? The tactics, techniques, procedures of those attackers so that our clients can uh, really have an effect on their, on their threat model um, as it applies to them. Um, so when you like, walk through that a little bit. So in the day-to-day -day responsibilities, you're doing proactive, invest, you're doing proactive uh, threat hunting, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, from regards to MITRE attack framework, but incident hits, Right. Uh, SOC throws a flag. The IR team is responding. Kind of walk through then what the cyber threat intelligence team, you know, what, how, how do they need to have that flexibility to surge to an incident, so to speak? And what kind of problems are they trying to solve that are maybe complementary, but maybe different than an IR team? Yeah, absolutely. So what I would expect the CTI team to provide a SOC team is context around what they're looking for. If it came from a hit, you know, let's say, let's just take malware as an example. I would expect the CTI team to be able to tell the SOC team what they should be looking for next, right? Because an attacker has an agenda. They have that malware on there. They're gonna collect data. They're gonna package the data. They're gonna send it out. They, have, they might use a particular C2 framework. And, and among all of that, the CTI team should be advising the SOC on what to be looking for to know where the attacker is uh, in, in, that, in that operation um, and if they've been successful or not. I mean, are you going? Are you going even as far as you know, looking for new domains or new IPs that might be used in subsequent attacks, and like, and ultimately kind of loading those to the proxy? Is it going that far, or is that still kind of that IR SOC level? I mean, how how, how in the weeds are you getting in there? Yeah, I mean, uh, other you know, that would be kind of like that remediation side of the of the IR process, right? And I think that would be a side of it if, if you're. If you have enough information about the adversary to be able to get ahead a little bit in the process, like absolutely, right? Like start loading those things in there, see if you can disrupt that attacker, increase the friction, you know, ahead of time as you're anticipating the next steps are going to take, um, and really just to, to reduce the amount of damage to the company. That's the whole goal, right? Hundred uh, percent. When a lot of people think of CTI, um, they usually cyber threat intelligence. They usually think uh, indicators of compromise with the with the security operations team. Uh, but thinking about you know, cyber threat intelligence holistically. Um, Seth, how have you seen CTI support for insider threat investigations? And I think it's important to kind of draw out what that kind of looks like, because I think a lot of people think inside threat programs, they think awareness, they think, you know, monitoring and behavior, monitoring behavior with UEBA tools. Um, how can threat intelligence be used for inside threat investigations? Because I think that's a part of incident response as well, and certainly incidents, incidents, incidents that the SOC deals with. Yeah, for sure. Um, so, We've had several clients come to us, uh, you know, relying on our expertise, access to information, tools, and tradecraft, um, where they have indications of possible insider threats. Um, these instances, instances include, uh, you know, cases where the client's proprietary information was posted publicly, or um, they found some fraudulent use of their source code. Uh, so when cases like that occur, um, they tend to be in something of a panic mode. Um, and, and when they're in panic mode, uh, you know, they want to, they want and need a lot of answers really quickly. Um, so what we do is we work with the client, uh, investigate how big is the problem, you know, how widespread is the information, where did it originate, uh, and, and potentially would a takedown be effective? Um, so often the way it turns out is our investigations start from a leak of internal information, um, the actor's unknown. Uh, and it isn't until we've gone through the process of attributing the originating actor, um, alert the client uh, that they're an insider, um, you know, once we've attributed them and found out that it's an insider. Um, and, and then we provide all of that information to the client and they're able to uh, get success through often legal or administrative action against the actor. And so what's an example, you know, kind of, uh, is, is that does the tip usually come, you know, from a leak that, you know, happens somewhere on the internet? And then is an insider always, you know, um, always, you know, the first first thought, or is it usually they don't know? I guess they kind of take us through that initial triage period 
when you see something or, you know, where there's an event, right, a security incident or an event, and then the steps you kind of have to go through with regard to inside threat. Because, I mean, when you talk inside a threat, I mean, now you're dealing with a lot of different stakeholders within the organization. It's not just the security team, right? It's working with HR. It's working with legal. It's working with probably outside counsel a lot of times. Um, yeah. Kind of, yes. Yeah, go ahead. Well, we've seen both. Um, it, there, We've seen it happen where, uh, you know, the client came to us and said, hey, we've we, we've noticed that our, our information is leaked. Um, or it, it's been where the we've identified for the client that their information has been leaked. And, um, you know, depending on where that comes from, it, the, the client may have an idea of, uh, of it being an insider, depending on how close hold that information is. Um, and yeah, so we've seen it both ways where we've identified it and then um, sought to uh, attribute the actor or um, or it's been, hey, we noticed our, our information was leaked and we think it might be an insider. Uh, we think it might even be this person. You know, could you go through the steps to try to verify? From a perspective, from a program perspective, right? Um, you probably have to have tools that monitor from the inside. You have to have security awareness training where you make your employees, you know, a sensor network, so to speak. Would you say you have to have an appropriate monitoring solution externally to ultimately look for these same type of leaks? Would, would, is, that, is, that, is that fair, like, rationale, how to think about think about that? Oh, yeah. I, I mean, uh, effective monitoring is, is really useful um, in, in just watching to see if things are leaked. Um, and then also just the the security posture on the inside and the training um, and, and you know making sure that employees are aware of um, what they should and shouldn't be talking about and and places they should and shouldn't be visiting while on their work computers and stuff. So uh, when we talk about fraud investigations, Valerie, uh, kind of walk through how cyber threat intelligence is used in fraud investigations, and it'd be helpful, I think, for the audience to understand broad investigations and then trust and safety investigations and you know how, how those things kind of play out? Yeah, good question. So trust and safety teams, most of the time they have really good visibility into their own services and their own platforms, but we've seen a lot of instances where it's been important to know what's happening off platform so that we have a more holistic view of issues that are affecting our clients. Uh, so, for example, I worked with clients that understood their platform was being exploited as a part of greater fraud operations, but typically the line of questioning that we get is, how do you get a handle on that? Um, so that's where we've gone and researched how their issues connect to fraud networks. Uh, these are things like carding and cracking, stolen PII, uh, login credentials, SMS pumping. It really runs the gamut. And so that's where we can really provide value and in both initial research and then monitoring peripheral issues that are affecting their team and their customers really, uh, which helps them to be able to make more of an impact. Um, it also helps inform their internal policy decisions. So if they need to make some changes up front, uh, then that can help them improve their customer experience in the long term. Uh, understanding that you know that that fraud aspect is so vast um you know Alicia, i'm kind of curious how you've seen uh, organizations you know you know craft intelligence requirements particularly with fraud and trust and safety teams yeah um so with the trust and safety teams they have quite a wide range of issues that they're actually concerned about so one of the issues that we address pretty regularly on my team is helping our clients to better understand what risk exists digitally for their company, not only internally, but also challenges that their customers could face looking at it from an indirect concern for our client. So oftentimes we're asked about emerging or trending digital threats that have recently gained media attention, or industry spotlight. So maybe something that their competitors are facing as an issue and they're concerned about that same issue coming to them. So since Nisos is a managed intelligence company, and what I mean by that is we do threat intelligence as a managed service. So part of what we do as a managed intelligence company is we look at the digital threat concerns specifically for how it's going to affect our client and how it could impact them in the future. 
In addition to looking at those direct threats, we also help provide visibility into external exposures that the company may have had. Um, and this information can range basically from leaked credentials to internal company documentation that's not meant for public release. And so the tailored analysis that we provide regarding this cyber intelligence helps our clients by enabling them to create new policies and procedures or modify existing ones that they already have in place. Um, let's go down that path for a second. Let's bring back a conversation we had at a conference last week. Um, and you see this a lot with assessments of applications that companies own. Um, Joe, from your perspective, what's kind of walk through the difference between hacking an application and using that application to hack others. So like, there's a big difference between that. I think that probably our audience kind of wants to hear about and Joe. I'd like to hear your opinions on that. Lisa, Elisa, after Joe. Kind of talk yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think it's, um, it's an interesting conundrum for a lot of our clients that run into this idea of uh, the, the bad guys using their services to send emails or host infrastructure or, you know, as just a pivot point um, to, to, to breach other organizations. Uh, and I think we're still figuring out as an organ as, as, a, as an industry, uh, what the, uh, I guess, where that liability lies and what we have to do as organizations to, to keep us from, from being used in that way. And Alicia, I'm kind of curious, you know, of, of some examples of how you've seen, you know, uh, how this kind of play out, you know, with, with, or, with, uh, with organizations. Yeah, um, so a lot of times it's something that a client will realize that they are vulnerable to early on, and they may have seen some of their information out on the internet, like whether it's by a friend or um, an actual client of theirs. Um, so they'll come to us saying like, you know, we we found out that this information's out there. Like what can can you guys help us figure out how it got out there and show us like, do we potentially have a vulnerability that we need to close the gap on? And so we'll, ident we'll do our best to identify like where that information came from and then provide them with like recommendations and next steps. So that way this issue doesn't happen to them again in the future. From that perspective, kind of like move, pivoting a little bit to um, the, for the physical security side, um, threat intelligence is used quite extensively. Uh, in security operations teams, we call it the GSOC, is typically the parlance there with physical security teams. Valerie, um, here's some examples of where you know intelligence is used to pre protect personnel and facilities. Yeah, that is a good question. Um, because first of all, I want to emphasize the link between cyber and physical security threats. Uh, they're always tied together, but the nuances are going to be different from client to client and from issue to issue. So with that, we see a lot of online threat activity that we report to our clients that's on a regular basis because of its potential to escalate into cyber or physical security threats, as well as damaging reputation. So in other words, we're not just focused on passing what has already escalated. We are looking at anticipation uh, based on behaviors and trends on what's going to happen. So for some clients, we provide tactical intelligence about real-time threat actors to pass on to their security teams. So this is equated to things like um, the identification of someone discussing threats online that is now converted into some sort of physical world action. So in those instances, we heavily rely on known me OSINT methodologies uh, so that we can quickly research those threats, we can cross-reference the information that we're finding before passing it, and we're verifying that information about threat actors, as well as really looking into the full context that is surrounding the threat. Um, and then we pivot between those leads to develop an overall fuller picture of our threat actor. So after passing to our clients, we can then continue monitoring to provide updates on whether or not something is escalating or if it is just as importantly de-escalating. So that takes some of the burden off of clients' internal security teams to both respond to, mitigate active threats, and then at the same time, uh, try to monitor for further activity. So it's also where the cohesiveness and the coordination that we have with our clients really shows value so that we can successfully protect both the personnel and the assets of our clients. 
Um, Valley, if you don't mind me asking, how do you filter the noise? Um, there's a lot you can probably detect from just trends, kind of necking down to actually specific threats, right? I think there's a huge difference between an alert that says, you know, the address of the company is X and, you know, where is that address? Some, you know what I mean? Where is that address? You know, I'm interested in that right now. Like that in social media parlance is really challenging to, you know, you know, need, find that needle in the haystack. Kind of, I'm curious to walk through just the, the, the uh, methodologies of ultimately kind of filtering the noise. Yeah, that's a good question. So there are a couple of ways that we do that. One is that we are not um, just looking for mentions. We're looking for mentions with context with some sort of uh, threat mention with it. We're also looking at the forum in which it was mentioned. So as a, for instance, if something is mentioned on a social media platform versus a closed chat group or some other um, deep or dark web source, then that's going to have a different response to these broad mentions that we may see overall, you know? So that's one thing. And then the second thing is that we're always uh, vetting and looking at content from an analytic perspective. So we're not just passing on raw information uh, that you might get from say a threat intel feed. We are analyst led. So with that comes the responsibility to vet this information and really review that context so that we can give that context to our clients and also a sort sometimes assign a sort of threat risk with that. Uh, Seth, from your side, when you think about brand reputation uh, and how to you know focus the discussion around brand reputation, because I think that's a incident that can come across physical security as well as cybersecurity, uh, all the way down to those forums. Kind of walk through how you know how, how that is how that's how that's actually done. Yeah, uh, so. Um... We, we have had some clients who come to us, uh, you know, they have questions about uh, business risk relating to uh, brand and reputation concerns regarding potential partnerships that they might be wanting to enter. Um, so we use our tools and databases, uh, gather information um, like social media activity, legal concerns, financial concerns, uh, anything that we can find on those potential partners. Um, then we take a, you know, a holistic approach to analyze all that data, figure out, you know, who is this person um, or entity? Uh, what are they about? And do we think that they might pose any brand or reputation risk for the client? Um, you know, in, in today's world, um, entering into a public partnership with an individual or even a company, uh, which might have like his, historical even uh, concerns can pose a risk to our client's reputation. Um, so, I mean, we've all seen uh, politicians, business leaders, influencers, um, even those that are like in good standing currently uh, have received a lot of backlash for something that they may have said online or maybe a picture of them that was posted from like many years ago. Um, so what we'll do is we try to find um, any of those concerns that might be present for a potential partner of our client uh, and, and raise that for their awareness. And then on the on the geopolitical event side, so you kind of touched on that a little bit, Seth. You know, Valerie, when we think about geopolitical events, that's usually a you know portion or a sector within a fiscal security landscape or program. Um, how do you go? How do, how do you? I mean, it's not hard to get a news feed of like you know what the major political events are happening. How do you ultimately make that relevant to an organization? Um, and and of course, like I think that's where media, like media and foreign media really, you know, are important there. Uh, walk through how you, you go beyond just a news feed. Yeah, so geopolitical events, first and foremost, they oftentimes fuel issues that are felt in other countries and by other industries, which a lot of us, you know, very know, very well know, we're very familiar with it. But another thing that we do at NISOS is we look for these peripheral events that can negatively impact our clients. So as an example, in uh, summer 2022, Sri Lankan protesters had raised, raided the presidential palace uh, because there were some ongoing fuel and food and medicine shortages. And so this event was really heavily publicized and it was passed around a lot of online communities who viewed this publicity as some sort of sign of success. So there was another impact that was a little bit less intended by this event. And that is that 
groups wanted to mirror the Sri Lankan protesters' success and their actions to address their own grievances. And so that translated into escalated physical security threats for our clients, in other words. So we saw a discussion of potential violent protests that had quite a few types of goals. Uh, so some examples were lynchings, uh, executions, and other more extreme forms of violence that we were seeing. So we were able to monitor and report on how discussions were escalating or de-escalating because we recognized that there were parallels there that were being drawn between this Sri Lankan protest and other communities with grievances against the industries that our clients work in. Alicia, from that perspective, when you're, when you're looking at disinformation as part of geopolitical events, because any geopolitical event, there's always a level of disinformation um, that is along with that. Uh, same methodologies in terms of doing conducting those types of investigations? What have you kind of seen in your research? Um, so slightly different approach. Uh, so fake news is definitely something that like everyone hears currently, um, but Sometimes our clients want to know like what specific stories or information is trending or gaining attention. And it's not only like what's on social media, but it's also what is gaining mainstream media attention. And so the 2022 Brazilian presidential election was definitely one that fell victim to disinformation spreading. And what we watched here in an investigation was a 30 minute video get turned into a very brief clip that actually went viral in under 24 hours. And that video was used to spread disinformation that um, directly aligned with what the former president of Brazil claimed. And that was in regards to the voting machines being vulnerable for fraud. So with our analysis, we were able to determine like how the video was posted by a political marketing agency and then shared through coordinated and authentic behavior of bots um, and sock puppet accounts. And that investigation enabled us to see if any of those individuals who helped spread the disinformation were also involved in the civil unrest activities in January 2023. And so while we didn't have any direct connections to client work, the coordinated and authentic network provided insight on how individuals could spread disinformation and how it could potentially impact a client's business operations globally. Um, question from the audience uh, that just came in, I think that has to do with our final section, actually. Uh, and I'll kind of turn this question to you, Joe. Uh, how do you handle threat intelligence scaling? Uh, when you get hit by the global supply chain issues uh, and when the needs fluctuate so wildly over days, weeks, and months. Uh, kind of curious of your thoughts there. Yeah, that's a, um, I mean, relevant threat intelligence, it really comes down to effective scoping in a lot of cases. And so when you're dealing with a large amount of issues across the globe and being affected, you know, if you're, if you're, organization is being affected in a few different ways. Uh, I would concentrate my intelligence gathering and my intelligence uh, requirements the same way that I would concentrate my security uh, scoping and requirements. And that is on the crown jewels, right? Like protect the thing that your business, that is core to your business, core to your organization, um, and make sure that your intelligence requirements also line up to that. And that way, when you get these geopolitical events and you're, you know, you reach out to to, to somebody, you know, hopefully needs us to help you like do that intelligence work that we could look at that scope and understand like what's most important to you and only bring that intelligence that's really, really relevant. I think that that has a, a lot to do. We only have, you know, we're, we're at the bottom, bottom of the hour. We can go a couple minutes over, uh, bottom of the half hour, go a couple minutes over. Um, with regard to that supply chain, um, a lot of times that comes with subsidiaries, it comes with mergers and acquisitions. Joe, kind of talk through, you know, how you ultimately protect uh, organizations, uh, alert them, you know, doing risk assessments uh, to not only supply chain vendors, but also, um, you know, mergers and acquisitions as well. Yeah, exactly. I'll, I'll keep it as succinct as I can since we're at time, but uh, it really comes down to um, giving companies more information to make a proper business decision. That's really what we what we try and do, right? And so when it comes to mergers and, acquisi mergers, mergers and acquisitions, not murders and acquisitions, that's a different Intel product, but mergers and acquisitions, uh, when it comes to, to those business decisions, like you really wanna know as much as you can about a business before you get to a partnership, right? Like Seth touched on it earlier, and so if it's, if it's their network-facing infrastructure, maybe shows that they don't do proper 
you know, they have all kinds of like information security problems on their network infrastructure. I'm not going to bring anything out, but, but you know, like the public facing infrastructure, if it looks bad, that's an indication that their IT maybe isn't great or their security program isn't very good. And so what problems are you going to deal with internally, right? They don't have that hard outer shell. What's the inside look like? Um, and you can do that same sort of thing from a, from a personnel standpoint, if they have all kinds of legal issues, HR issues that are out there, there's been a bunch of court cases and things like that you know, those reputation concerns. And so that's what we're really trying to do as, as a product is give a client, a, you know, a, a good product that encapsulates both those things, both those elements of personnel and the technical uh, risks uh, to help them make that like that, that next big business decision. And from that perspective as well, it's not only just technical cybersecurity risk when we talk about the supply chain and mergers and acquisitions, Joe, um, kind of walk through how open source intelligence and the broader threat intelligence uh, discipline can ultimately illuminate, you know, different, um, you know, different personnel, different personnel risks, other, other companies that they might be involved with, um, you know, kind of walk through, you know, what that aperture is beyond just, you know, the, there's, there's cybersecurity hygiene. Yeah, exactly. So, so one of the biggest things we've dealt with more recently with the, um, the invasion of Ukraine um, is, is the idea of sanctions, right? And so you're dealing with uh, financial corporations and, uh, you know, venture capitalists or what have you that might be based out of a, of a country that starts a war with another country, then suddenly, like, you have to weigh those, that next level of financing when, it, when you're looking at your partnerships. And that's one example, right, that financing side of it. From a personnel perspective, you're also looking for those relationships, right? Do they have connections with sanctioned entities? Like, are they friends on Facebook? You know, uh, that's kind of an indication, right? Um, and so that's there's there's all these things out there. People people live on the internet these days, um, and we're just experts at like getting all that information together and coming up with uh, with with intel for the clients. And then last question, I swear, uh, Alicia from the audience, can you elaborate on what coordinated inauthentic behavior is? Oh yeah, um, excellent question. So. Coordinated inauthentic behavior involves multiple individuals that have like they've either been friends with each other or they are interacting on each other's post or potentially involved off platform, like looking at two different social medias, maybe they're friends on one, but not friends on this one. And so if if you can see that connection of interaction, even if it's on two different platforms, it's how they're working with each other. And so the, the coordinated element comes in is when you see individuals like strategically stagger and post information around the same time, or even sometimes, um, which has been the instance with some of our bot cases, is we've noticed them being post at the exact same time. And all of the information that's in that post, uh, the language and the verbiage is exactly the same. It, if I could elaborate on that a little bit, I mean, we've we've even seen um, we've even seen like Telegram channels where the activity is extremely coordinated, and and so a, a post is shared in the Telegram channel to say this is the thing we're going to post, and then you'll see you know ten or fifteen accounts on different social media platforms post that same exact thing. So it's almost you you think that we're at the bottom of the half hour. Guess what? One more question from the audience. Uh, how would you recommend getting budget for doing more due diligence before mergers and acquisitions to include cyber risk? Uh, I'm sure that there's no shortage of uh, takers. So let's Seth, let's Seth, let's start with uh, with you on that question, sir. Yeah, sure. So um, getting budget uh, it is um, always going to be a tricky thing. So uh, from our perspective, um, getting budget is more for um, aligning to the to the proper tools to be able to do what we need to do. Um, from a client perspective, uh, getting budget to to look into cyber risks is, um, a, you know, a different problem. Um, I, I think the the way the, the method that I would go with is to uh, explain the need for it and um, and show the costs associated with not having those cyber risks outlined ahead of time, uh, ahead of a, a mergers and acquisition, because um, there are plenty of cases that we've seen where uh, a company was acquired and then bringing them on um, was extremely costly uh, because of those cyber risks. So I think it's a, it's a money save proposal. 
But you agree with that, Joe? I mean, you've seen we've seen a range of some of our clients, you know, have a slug that's on the bottom of our, you know, Intel reports that ultimately reports up and to a dollar loss, accumulated dollar loss. Um, but then, of course, that's very sophisticated maturity teams um, all the way down to, you know, not, you know, uh, as mature teams, which is all good, depending on where they're where they are. Would you generally agree then, like, you know, that for, you know, the the ROI for more diligence is really on that uh, risk management perspective? Would you would, would you agree there? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think you could definitely take like that, that, you know, the the formula that they give you in the CISP program for, you know, weighing the risk, right? Like putting a dollar amount to risk. So you could absolutely go, go to that um, level. Um, I think in most cases, what you should do is um, establish a program. Like what I would recommend is that, you know, you, your businesses have programs if they do common mergers and acquisitions, right? So they say, okay, this is how we do a merger and acquisition. They have a legal team for it. They have, you know, an IT team maybe or some sort of like business marketing. They have a team that's in charge of that. You get in that process, right? And make that part of the process. You get in there and you say, hey, listen, we need to do some level of you know, like looking at this company from a security standpoint, from a reputation standpoint, to help us understand what we're getting into. You make sure that's part of the process. You get in there, get with your legal team. Um, you start, you start telling the story, um, and uh, I, I feel like you get people buy in, and then you worry about the budget side of things. And that seems to be a little bit easier, right, Joe? Because I mean, it, corporate development is usually the people buying companies. And everything they're focusing on is usually the financial nature and the product nature and the sales nature, right? I mean, the product teams and, you know, sales teams are really what drive, you know, M&A. It'd probably be just to align with those two organizations, those two organizations, and ultimately bring the security risk management aspect of that uh, as well. That would seem to be, would you agree that's probably the... Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And I'm sure in a lot of cases, insurance, like once you start that process insurance is going to do some level of due diligence for that as well, right? Depending on who you have for cyber insurance. Um, there's going to be some requirements there, I'm sure. It's just a matter of, you know, are you are you getting down the road and then learning about the problems after you have to pay for, you know, some diligence for the finance and all that stuff? Or you do, do you do it ahead of time, right? Can we bring cyber kind of risk uh, identification investigations earlier earlier on in the process of, of an M&A? Um, and, and yeah, that probably depends on the type of business and, you know, how much you are investing, you know, in this business, right? You got to weigh that, you know, appropriately. Seth, Joe, Alicia, Valerie, I can't thank you enough uh, for joining the webcast. Thank you for being panelists. Thank you to all of our audience uh, for joining. Uh, again, my name is Landon Winklevoss. Follow us on nisos.com and everybody have a great day. Thank you very much. Thanks, team.